Thank you for coming to the uh, lecture. Uh, and welcome to the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences, as well as the Dean's Lecture Series. And this is the first of the lectures for this year. And I am Mohan Kumar, the uh, chair of the Department of Computer Science in the Golisano College. And it is my pleasure and privilege today to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Sandy Pentland of MIT. The goal of this lecture series, which was started about 10 years ago, is to bring uh, leading minds from academia, from industry, and from the government to RIT campus and uh, share their ideas with the students and faculty in, at RIT. And today's speaker is the 48th, 48th speaker in this series. Wow. So we have two more to go to celebrate. <laughs> so at this time, I would also like to acknowledge our professional interpreter, Kate, for translating the uh, talk to the uh, audience. And again, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Sandy Pentland. Sandy is a globally recognized authority on big data, and he is the director of the MIT's Human Dynamics program and the MIT Media Lab Entrepreneur Program. In addition, Sandy is the lead academic for the World Economic Forum's Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives. And he was chosen by Forbes as one of the world's seven most powerful data scientists. So in today's lecture, titled Social Physics and the Beginning of Big Data Society, Sandy will discuss the impact of big data and the need for a new deal on data to preserve privacy and personal safety. So sit tight. I've heard Sandy talk before, and it will be a great talk. I can assure you that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good turnout here. This is great. And a beautiful day. Um, so thank you. So what I wanted to do today is talk about sort of my view about big data and um, the things that I think are the most important and the things that are misunderstood. So big data is this you know, buzz phrase. It's everywhere, everything's big data. Um, and you see these definitions like, you know, it's volume, velocity. It's like, well, yes and no. I mean, actually, uh, if you look at video, video is bigger, you know, online video, bigger, faster than almost anything else. Uh, and it's been around for decades in very many formats. So what I think is actually different is not so much the bigness of it as the depth of it. Um, so now we have data that is very detailed data about all sorts of things, but most importantly, about people. Um, it used to be you could live your life in uh, relative obscurity from uh, the point of view of the digital webs. Uh, that surround us. But today, as you move around, you leave breadcrumbs everywhere. And that's the thing that's really changed from your cell phone, from your credit cards, from driving down the highway. And that's huge data. It's continuous data. And that's really the difference. So I want to talk about that today and the, the good things about it and also the bad things about it. But first of all, I want to introduce myself a little bit, uh, maybe put a little humor into things. So this is me uh, back in 1993, uh, this one here. Because <laughs> um, what occurred to me was people were beginning to talk about computers everywhere. I mean, I have to remember that PCs and things like that were you know, barely a decade old, and they were actually getting out into society, and the internet was beginning to grow. And people talked about pervasive computing, computing everywhere. And I said, well, you know, Actually, if computers are going to get that small and that powerful, they're going to get built into our cufflinks and our glasses and things like that long before they get built into walls, because we don't renovate the walls very much. So what I did is I created uh, uh, the first cyborg collective. right? So you got Star Trek, right, and the Borgs. We had the Borgs. We had it about the same time as they did, maybe a little before. These are some of the Borgs. And back then, to simulate what it would be like to live today, we had to have the students run around with these uh, motorcycle batteries, this big, right? You know, 10 pounds, and a PC-104 PC that was hot enough that you didn't want to touch it. 
right? <laughs> and these little displays that are actually vibrating mirrors so that you could see stuff. But of course, today that turned into uh, Google Glass and all the watches that people are beginning to do. But the nice thing is, is that guy in front there, that's Thad Starner. So, so he's got into this enough that he wore that sort of thing for the next 20 years until Sergey Brin said, OK, guy, make it real. And now he's the technical lead for Google Glass. So I like to sometimes describe myself as the grandfather of Google Glass. <laughs> I didn't wear it for all those years, but, but we helped uh, cause the problem, shall we say. Um, I do a number of other things, too. As, as was mentioned, I run uh, co-lead the, the discussion around big data and personal data, which is privacy uh, and security at the World Economic Forum. So there's a, if you ever wondered what it's like you know, to go to Davos and the World Economic that's what it looks like. It doesn't look like too much. It's a hotel room with a bunch of people and business suits and stuff. But they're pretty amazing people. I mean, the vice president of the EU is in there. There's a special representative from the National Security Council. There's the CEO of uh, Visa. The, you know, and it's, it's a sort of interesting crowd. And, and my role is to make sure that they talk and not fight. Right? OK. And then I do a number of other things, too. So I'm on the advisory board of Motorola Mobility, which you might remember is owned by Google now. And uh, one of the biggest sort of client, mobile client of Google, is Samsung. So they don't want to fight with Samsung. And what that means is Motorola Mobility has to reinvent what it means to be a, a cell phone. And you remember I did the wearable computing stuff years ago? So coming soon to a store near you. I also uh, am helping to run the first uh, uh, autonomous, commercially accessible uh, autonomous vehicle in the world produced by Nissan. And uh, I advise Telefonica on what they ought to do. Start companies, do stuff like that. Forbes likes me. Anyway, so that's what I do. So let's talk about big data. Uh, I wanted to tell you that, to give you a sense of where I come from, because this is my view on big data. It's not the canonical truth. There is no canonical truth at this point. So when you think about big data, what everybody thinks about is Google and Flickr and Facebook. And those are certainly important and familiar. Um, but that's actually not where the action is. I think that while those are things to be concerned about and think about, the real action is around the fact that wireless is finally here. So what this diagram shows is the distribution of wireless devices in the world. Okay, that's all the yellow stuff. The blue stuff are the big undersea cables that carry the bits around. But the thing that's the most striking change in our world is not Google, it's not Flickr, it's the fact that virtually every adult in the human race has a sensor package that knows where they are, knows who their friends are, knows, you know, all sorts of stuff about them, and they have the ability to give and send digital data, messages. Everybody is connected now. It's amazing. I mean, I, you know, you go to the most remote places in Africa, and you find that the average phone ownership is, you know, 90% of the adult citizens. That's typical. In many places, the average phone ownership in the poorest countries, the average phone ownership is like 1.2 per person. And the reason is, is the phone companies are fighting. And then there are also things like you have the phone that you use with your wife's family and the phone that you use with the, you know. <laughs> Lots of interesting cultural variations. But what that means is that you can do things that you've never done, never dreamed were conceivable. The way we think about the world is really different. Let me give you a couple of examples that are from my students and myself. So, this is one, it's a little startup company. What it does is it, it sends coupons to people to buy shampoo and so forth. That's not a terribly interesting thing. But the guy that started this started with a sort of small pot of money and ended up with a customer list of 3.48 billion people in under a year. Now, how did he do that? Well, he went to seven people who happened to run some of the seven largest phone companies and said, can I use your network to reach people for consumer products? And you know, we'll pay SMS fees to go back and forth and we'll give them top up minutes and we'll use your network, right? And then of course they said, sure, we're gonna make money off this. 
But think about that. To be able to reach a startup without a lot of money, to be able to reach the majority of humans in the world in under a year, that's just completely unheard of. It takes companies decades to build up a fraction of that size. Now, I don't want to say this is the world's best business or anything like that, but the ability to scale like that with the existing infrastructure is incredible. And Moore's law tells us that all of those phones that are out there are going to be smartphones in just a couple of years. Already, almost everywhere in the world, every village, every small businessman has a smartphone. Now, not everybody has a smartphone, but pretty soon it's going to be that way. And that means another huge change in communication. Here's another thing that a student and I did in India. Um, there are these things called top-up minutes. How many people know what top-up minutes are? Yeah, so you can buy, in most parts of the world, minutes to put in your phone. You give them some money, they put more minutes on your phone so you can call things. And that's, rather than having a normal plan, that's the way you get communications. Well, those minutes are a little bit like cash, aren't they? And so what they did is, uh, they set, so this guy's oxygen set up a little exchange. So if you had minutes on one network, you could set up, trade them for minutes on another network. And they essentially made a virtual cache. And what we had done is set up a, a network of over 100,000 retailers, very small retailers. Only thing they have really in common is, you know, six square foot, six square foot, not like 600, right? Six, right? A store and a phone. And what you can do now is you can take those top up minutes and you can pay that little retailer in the middle of nowhere to buy whatever it is you need. And you can even take cash out. You can give him some minutes, he'll give you some cash. Suddenly you have this alternative economy that lets you buy things, sell things, trade things. Hundreds of millions of people. And again, you can spin it up almost immediately. I mean, not that it's not a lot of hard work, but that's a really different way of doing business. And you also have to remember that almost all these people are unbanked. They've never really been part of the formal economy before. It's really transformative. Here's another spin out. Um, and this is one that the chief technical officer of the United States describes as a real game changer. And if you think about it, some pe people laugh at this, right? It's a check engine light. Your car has a check engine light, right? When something's going wrong, it says check engine, right? Do you have a check engine light? Well, you ought to, right? <laughs> Think about it. So in the healthcare system today, um, we, have, we are out of money. <laughs> we don't do a very good job of delivering healthcare. But there's another aspect, which is that there are lots of estimates that say that most visits, the vast majority of visits to the doctor, are at the wrong time. They're the worried well. They're the, well, I'm sorry, sir, but you know, if you live long enough, you may get out of the office sort of visit. Um, it's, it's not at the right time. What you'd like to do is you'd like to know when somebody should get help precisely. But what happens when you're beginning to get sick? Well, actually what happens is your behavior changes. You don't go out as much. You don't call the same people. You don't look. I mean, that's a, when you have a friend that's getting sick, you say, you don't look, look like you're doing so well, right? What is it you're picking up on? You're picking up on these behavior changes. You can do the same thing through sensing of the phone. So the little check engine light goes on says, you're not acting like yourself. Something's wrong. Maybe you ought to find out, right? And what that does is that gets people to the doctor in time to do something. And it also tends to reduce the worried well, because after all, my check engine light isn't on, right? Another app example of this, another spin out, is um, something that measures mental health. If you look at the criteria for depression, diagnosis of depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, one, three things come up again and again and again. One is you change how you socialize with people. D different diseases are slightly different, but people's social life changes dramatically. Their activity level changes. If for some diseases like depression, you tend to just sort of cocoon away and not do anything. For others, you get frantic and you're everywhere, all it, right? But it's a major change. And the third thing is it disrupts your daily habits. You become irregular in your habits. Well, guess what? 
you can measure all those things off of the sensors in your phone. So it's not quite the, the, the check engine light, because that's sort of a general thing. This is something that, you know, if you under doctor care, can be used to have a continuous monitoring with the doctor. And that's actually how it's used. So the point of telling you these things is to sort of break your mindset about what's possible. There's this infrastructure out there of sensors and connectivity that makes it possible to reach almost everyone in the world almost immediately and do things that only your best friend could do before. And that's astounding. That's the thing that's driving big help. Now, what I've shown are all things that are actually pretty familiar. But you can go a lot farther than this, OK? So let me show you another thing. So this is something I did uh, a few years ago. So these are people moving around in San Francisco. And these big dots, well, those are like stores and restaurants and things where people go quite frequently. Looks like a nice city. But if you analyze this, what you find is you find that the city is really made up of separate populations, subgroups that really don't mix with each other at all. They walk right by each other on the street. But you know, there's the, the group that likes the edgy bars and the avant-garde music. And there's the conservative people. And then there's this crowd and that crowd. And they don't actually mix that much. And if you watch where they choose to go using GPS and things like that, you can pick out the places that are for group one versus group two versus group three. So you can begin to stratify the population. Now, this is just like demographics. You don't even know who these people are. In fact, this was done off of the one I'm showing you was done off of taxi cab data. Right? Where did taxis pick up? Where do they drop out? Well, it turns out different types of people go to different places. They choose to go to different places. And of course, you can do it in lots of ways. But once you know where these clusters are, you can go talk to some of the people in the cluster. Like I can go talk to these guys here. Right? What do these guys have in common? You, know, you can't guess from the map, but unless you know San Francisco really, really well, those guys are hard partiers. Okay? They really are. They have almost an order of magnitude more likelihood of, let me see, I did this backwards, of getting alcohol poisoning. And there's another group that has a factor of almost five greater likelihood of getting diabetes. Now, diabetes is an enormous cost to our society. It comes from a lot of things. It's not like one cause. It's a whole bunch of things. But it's really interesting that there are places where pre-diabetics go and places where pre-diabetics don't go. And we don't really know why. But once you know where they go, you know where to set up a get yourself screened center, right? <laughs> More intelligible in the way I had this organized was if you know people's choices about where to spend time, you know a lot about their preferences. So everyone talks about, oh, Facebook, they post all this stuff. Well, the stuff you post on Facebook is the stuff you want other people to know, and you edit it to project the face that you want to do, right? Nobody actually tells the truth on Facebook. Okay? It's not human nature. But where you spend time is a real commitment. That's who you are. And so by looking at where people spend time, you can tell a huge amount about them. So obviously, what their preferences are, what they chose, Things that aren't obvious from location, but you know, the people that all go to you know, these sorts of places tend to dress the same. It's really interesting. It's a very strong thing. And so marketers look at that and say, oh, those are the guys that buy the leather pants. <laughs> OK. And these people over here, those are the women that buy the red dresses. Now I know where to advertise, and now I know where to put up a store. If you put all this stuff together, what you get is you get a sense of the rhythm of a city. So you know that it, you know, in the middle of a weekday that there are people doing these sort of activities there, and they tend to like these sort of products. There are other people doing other things in other places. And that it changes at night. There are different places going to different places, different people going to different places. So you can begin to design a city to reflect the patterns of the people. Who's getting nervous? 
Oh, okay, you've been for a while? Good. <laughs> you should be getting there. <laughs> okay. Now, you can use this in lots of ways. So let me give you an example of something that we did recently. So I helped talk Orange, which is a large carrier in Europe and Africa, into uh, releasing the data they had uh, about folk coral usage in the Ivory Coast. And we also got the UN to release all the data they have, and the World Economic Forum to release all the data they have. And we made this big data commons. And it's probably, arguably, the first in the world that shows all these sorts of things about all the people in the Ivory Coast. Now, the people in the Ivory Coast are a little special. First of all, they're very poor. Um, second of all, they just finished a very violent civil war. So there's a lot of places that, for instance, the government can't go, right? Because they get shot. That's the way of civil wars. Um, now, this data, we, we did a lot of interesting things to it. We aggregated it right, around cell towers, so you can't see individual people. And we chopped it up, so you can't track things for long periods of time, only for like a week or two at a time. And what that means is it's very, very hard to understand particular people. But you can see average patterns really well. And so what we did with this data is we released it to some 90 groups around the world, research groups, to be able to say, what can you do for the Ivory Coast, to help the Ivory Coast? And I'll show you some examples. One group in Dublin looked at their transportation. I know you can't understand this. I can't either. Looked at the transportation network. And it turns out that using this sort of data, you can tell people where, where people start in the morning, where they work or make money, and when they go back. So you know what the transportation they'd like to have. Now, the subtle thing is, is that the way transportation is done everywhere in the world is somebody stands there, and they put out those little pipe, you know, rubber things, and they count the number of cars going by or number of people going by. But they don't know where those people started from or where they're going. They don't know where they'd like to go as a transportation network. And so if you know this thing, which is called an origin destination matrix, you can design a transportation system that's a whole lot better. Because you can build, put the buses you know, that go from the places where people live to the place where they work. They never knew that before. And when they mapped that onto the existing bus system, they discovered that small changes very small changes would reduce the commute time by 10%. 10% is big when you do it across a huge city, right? in terms of pollution, in terms of energy cost, in terms of wear and tear on the people. Another sort of thing is the public health systems. So infectious disease depends on people interacting, right? And if you're going to set up interventions, you know, telling people you know, to stay home or telling people to wash their hands or or giving people inoculations, you got to know where the people are. But they never knew where the people were. In fact, we don't know where the people are in this country. We don't know where people interact. And that means we can't set up a public health system that's really effective. So using this sort of data, they were able to finally map the places where people got the flu. They were also to track back and find places where people got diseases like malaria, which you don't have to worry about here. but it's a big problem there. And estimates are that they'll get about a 20% reduction in flu propagation the next time they have a flu season, which should be about now. Pretty good. More interestingly, they were able to do, another group was able to do something else, which is shown here. Now in the Civil War, they had the battle lines ended up around here. And so it was thought that this was a north-south division. Um, because really nobody knew where the ethnic groups were. These were battles between different ethnic groups. But it turns out that's not the case. It turns out you can use this data about mobility and communication to figure out who talks to who. And of course, if you all speak the same language, you tend to speak to each other more than speaking to other people. And similarly, you know, you visit your relatives more than you visit random other people. So you can map out ethnic divisions pretty accurately. And what they discovered is the ethnic divisions are not north-south the way they thought they were. They're vertical, which means you can now begin taking much more effective action at trying to defuse tensions at the places where the ethnic groups come together. This map's even more interesting. So they don't have any data about poverty in the northern part of the 
country, right? Because you go up there, you get shot. It's you know, hard to collect data when you're, when you're dead. So, um, but there is a technique that you can do with this data that gives you a very accurate sense of what's called multi-factor poverty. So it turns out that level of disposable income, child mortality, crime rate, life expectancy, all co-vary. One goes up, the others go up. One goes down, the others go down. So you just put them together in one factor, MPI. It turns out that when people are feeling more comfortable, they explore more. So they move around to more diverse places. They call more diverse people. And when they're feeling threatened in various ways, they do less of that. And you can average that over regions to get a very accurate estimate of this MPI. So that's pretty amazing if you think about it. So that means I can look at the average cell phone traffic and tell you how many babies are dying. Literally. I'm not like, you know, making this up, right? And I can do it really pretty well. And I could do it today. I don't have to send people out in the field. There's none of this one census every 10 years sort of stuff, or ask all the doctors to do, well, what doctor? It's Ivory Coast. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, finding out you know, from people where the stuff is. You can actually look at things like poverty conditions. You can look at things like the spread of infectious disease. And if you can look at it, you can begin doing things. Because, among other things, you can have a conversation with the government that says, well, you say that you've helped you know, this area a whole lot. But look, <laughs> it doesn't look that way. What's going on? Until you know that, you can't have that conversation. Okay. So what I wanted to do in the sort of first half of the talk here is give you a sense that, first of all, big data is data about people primarily. Yes, there's the Internet of Things and coordination. But the real thing that's happening here is more Internet data about people. And that's a scary thing. <laughs> because if you can tell all that about people, who owns it? Who oversees it? So recently, there have been a lot of news about the National Security Agency. Everybody hears about that, right? And the National Security Agency, we're just looking at metadata, right? What did I just show you? Every single, single thing I showed you here was metadata. Not a thing wasn't metadata, I don't think. No, nothing was not metadata, OK? So that's what you can do with all that data. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I'm not going to debate that. But, uh, but I'll tell you, this is a really interesting and new capability. And it's here now, OK? And uh, the NSA is sort of the famous example. But the other thing that's happening, of course, is that companies are using this. Sometimes little companies, sometimes unethical companies. I have a little game I play on my cell phone because my son plays it. Right? It's sort of interesting. You know, but, but what's really interesting is when they update the software because they send you a little note. And by looking at the note, it's always in broken English, you can tell that this was written by somebody whose native language is Chinese. Okay. And then you look at the permissions on the thing. And I said, well, we want to know where you are and who you call. Why does a video game want to know where I am and who I call, especially given that the data then goes back to China? Right? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Let's think about that one. <laughs> okay. So uh, it, it matters who owns this data and who controls it. Okay. Now, what typically happens next is people say, privacy. Right? I've got to worry about privacy. Shut it all down, right? Because um, that's been sort of the, the tradition. But I hope you remember the last 10, 15 minutes that I can tell you where the babies are dying. I can tell you who's going to get flu and die in a pandemic. I can tell you how to design cities to be more energy efficient. You want to lock it all down, you give up all those public goods. It's real simple. You tell me how many babies you want to die? Seriously, I'll tell you how to lock it down. OK? There has to be a better solution. Um, and the end of the solution comes as follows. So what I'm going to give you is sort of a summary and a little bit of history of the discussion at Davos. And then what some of the people who are part of it, so that includes people like 
the Justice Commissioner of the EU, the head of the Federal Trade Commission, folks of that sort. Uh, what's happened because of, and then where things are going. And it's particularly interesting because this is a computer science crowd. I know not everybody's computer science, but you ought to be interested in it because it's sort of your stuff. Um, so 1950, this is the way systems and society work. Um, you showed up in the bank, you know, you talked probably to somebody you knew because you lived there for quite a while and, and you gave them your signature, physical signature, and they compared it to the other signature, right? And that's how you certified your identity and how you got services. And privacy was not a big deal because the worst that would happen is the teller would go tell somebody else in your church group or something like that. Uh, but it certainly wasn't a go to faceless bureaucrats and wherever, right? Because there was no, it's too expensive to copy all that stuff down, right? And then we got electronics. We got, you know, IBM 360s. We got CCP TVs. We got fax machines. And in the 60s, people got scared because suddenly the old traditions that made data local, make it personal, were breaking down. And our modern notions of privacy were born in legislation that said, OK, guys, we're going to lock things down. This is not OK. And I mean, I know the people that actually wrote that legislation, that they're still alive and kicking. Um, and the idea was, OK, we have this way of doing things, and we're going to make the electronic way of doing things match the physical one, right? Nothing else allowed. Well, that sounds good, but what's happened over the years is that people have realized that this data is really valuable. And they found all the little corners where you can sneak the data out and you can sit it out under the table and all those. And so now what we have is this gray market. We have people spying on us. We have things happening that we don't know. Because this, this legislation was sort of like, just lock it down, right? They didn't envision that people would find all these ways around it. So we got a problem. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the core is that the computer systems have to, in some sense, be compatible with these sort of more human systems. Our expectations about what happens up here have to match our expectations that we grow up with and, as humans, we tend to expect. Now, I don't mean this in a sort of uh, uh, arty or, or way. We have certain you know, things that are in our biology about what we can think and what we can't think, certain capacity limitations. We have expectations about social relationships, about causality. And basically, we have to be able to know what's happening up here in the same way we knew what was happening here. Um, that's the thing that you want to go for, that I would claim. And um, the key to it is to put this data into a framework that's understandable. And the key thing here is to think about it and say, well, what's happened is this data is now very valuable. That means it's an asset to somebody. OK? Now, we know about assets. We have money. We think about that just fine, right? I mean, we get confused and make mistakes, but we do with money pretty well. We have property, right? We own land, we can sell it. You know, I sort of understand how that works, right? Around the edges, it's a little, little ragged, but, but maybe we could do the same thing with, with data. And everyone says, oh, well, but you can make copies of data. Well, I've got some news for you. You know, the things in your bank that you think are your money, it's really just ones and zeros, OK? But there's a system on top of it that makes sure they can't just arbitrarily copy your data and, and take it from you and stuff like that. And the system is actually one that's based on very old principles. These principles first evolved actually in the United Kingdom, in Britain, um, and they were ownership rights, the right to possess, dispose, and control. Now, it's not the same as ownership. It's rights, not full ownership, and what that means is that some of the dispute resolution is different, sort of a technical legal thing, to keep those in mind. And so back in 2007, I proposed what I call the New Deal on Data. 
and help start this discussion within the forum and other places. And the vision is this, is, is that data is an asset. And the first thing you have to do with data, therefore, with this asset, is decide who controls it. Whose asset is it? Does it belong to the government? So you show hands. Who thinks it belongs to the government? Good. <laughs> Some countries you would get more hands up, right? Um, who thinks it belongs to things like the telcos and the banks? Mm. Who thinks that you should have control of it? Yeah, OK. So instant experiment. The only politically viable solution is individuals control data about themselves. Nothing else is going to make it as a sort of stable political statement. Not a statement of principles, not a statement of you know, mathematical fact. It's a statement of politics. So in these meetings, you have senior politicians, you have companies, and you have people like me who cause trouble. And the idea is, is you need something that's a win for the politicians. They want to get reelected. The companies have to be able to make money. And the citizenry has to be protected and get value from it. You need the win, win, win. And the solution that got hammered out, basically, gives people much more control over their right, over their data about them. Um, and I'll explain this in a little bit um, and the system that goes with it. The, the ideas have been codified into um, the EU Data Protection Acts and, the, and the stem from the human rights parts of the EU Constitution that give people literal ownership of data that is about them. In this country, it's in the US Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, which is not yet enacted, but also in the regulatory framework that's been put forward and is being acted on by the Federal Trade Commission. The idea is roughly that whenever people collect data about you, they have to give you informed consent. So how many people are familiar with informed consent? So you do this whenever you go take a medical procedure or participate in a human subjects experiment. They have to tell you, this is the data we're going to collect. This is what we're going to do with it. This is the risk that you have. And this is the benefit you're going to have. And you can opt out at any time, and we will destroy your data. Those are the things that you have to do as when you do human subject experiments. And that's the thing that people are willing to do in these new regulatory frameworks. Now, you might ask. OK, I see why the government would want to do that. But why would companies want to do that? That's the sort of first thing. Right? And the answer is, is that most of the companies at the table don't trade data yet. They're regulated industries. So the data I showed you, those are telcos. Right? Telcos don't actually trade data because they're licensees of the government. They're regulated. If they get caught with a hand in the cookie jar, it's bad for them to say nothing of what their clients, their customers are going to think, right? I mean, if, if Verizon really screws up, everyone's going to go to AT&T. So Verizon really doesn't want to do anything that's, that's really bad for those reasons. Same thing with banks, same things with hospitals. But if, in fact, they give you this sort of rights, really inform you what's happening, then what this regulation says is, they can go ahead and do it. So for instance, they can say, look, we'd like to take this data about you and do the following thing for it, and we'll pay you in this way with better services or more money. And you have the right to say yes or no. And if you decide later, having said yes, that you don't like it anymore, you have the right to say no, and they have to get rid of it. And for them, that's a big step up from where they are today, which is not being able to do anything. So this is the, the version that's being on the table in the EU. Um, single set of rules throughout the EU, but even outside the EU. So if you're a company and you give a subsidiary or a subcontractor some data, they have to follow the EU rules. And you're liable for them. So that puts real teeth in it. Consent is required. And data portability. So I told you about informed consent. Data portability means that you can say to Amazon, I want to have an XML file that gives all my purchase history in a form that is computer readable, and incidentally, that I can then send to Barnes and Noble, and Barnes and Noble can use. That's data portability. 
right? Or get your, your hospital record and give it to a different hospital and they can use it. So it gives consumer pressure to be able to you know, clean up their act. Right to be forgotten, to get rid of the data. Um, unfortunate battle in the EU over this because some people took this too literally. You know, companies have to retain data for crime. You know, was this person there on the night of so-and-so? Or for auditing, you know? We think you're cooking your books, we want to go back and see. So there's a lot of reasons why customers, companies have to retain data, but they can take data offline so that they don't have it normally. Um, big fines. So that's, that's the type of thing that's being proposed, both here and in the EU. That grounds out in um, particular things. So one is, when you start building computer systems, and I'll be happy to talk to people about this afterwards, there has to be really trusted identity. So how many of you have too many passwords that you can possibly remember and curse at this at least once a day? <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs> so, so one of the ideas, and this is a, in this country, it's called the National Strategy for Trusted Identity in Cyberspace. Uh, and one of my guys co-chairs that, and it's the idea of getting rid of passwords. Yay! And replacing them with the sorts of things that the military uses. The military doesn't use passwords everywhere. There's ways of propagating secure identity without having all those things. A cheesy version of it is already offered by people like Facebook. So how many people log in using Facebook to other services using Facebook? It's easy, right? You know, now Facebook knows Google. everything about you, right? Google, Google though. Okay, you Google use Google. But, two, but, but, step verification and yeah, but, but, and it's easy, and it, it's very cool, except now Facebook or Google know like everything about you, right? So it's, it's got that downside. So the idea is to come up with a national framework that's like this, where Google and Facebook don't own it, right? Um, informed consent, we talked about that a little bit. Metadata. So, when you put data into the bank, oh yeah, that's right, you call it money, right? When you put money into the bank, um, they have metadata about that, about who owns that data, and what you can do with it. Is it this sort of account or that sort of account, right? And they get audited. And the simple idea is, is that ought to be something you can do with personal data. So if you share your data with somebody in order to you know, get better service, you ought to be able to check automatically, just like on the computer, that they're doing the right thing and that um, they have penalties if they don't, automatic audit. And interestingly, of course, a lot of the sort of big computer system guys, like Microsoft and so forth, think this is great because, among other things, they're going to make the systems that do this, right? And other companies already have this. So some of the big telcos already have this. And then in this country, there's a bit of a battle about do not track. So all of this is no good if you don't know you're being tracked. So there has to be some sort of evidence that you're being tracked. Anyway, that's a little technical, but I figured a lot of you guys sort of have a computer science bit. Um, in my lab, we've done a couple things in this area. The main thing is that we built something called Open Personal Data Store. Um, so this is the right to physically control, I mean, as much as you can because to control your data, you need a store where you control the store. You have ownership rights to it. And uh, so we've developed uh, with uh, support from both the government and industry a framework for doing this. Uh, and it's part of sort of a global movement to really make these rights something that are effective, right? By having software that really does it. And it, it has a couple of different things. I don't know how much I want to talk to about it. One of the main ones is that it's not just computer science, it's also contract law. So there's this idea that um, what you do is you have, when you, when you share data, there's a contract behind it, and that has to be something that gets instantiated in this computer code. I don't know if this is too technical. Here. No, it's great. Good. Keep going. Okay, so what, you remember the phrase, um, I think it's not Willie Horton, Willie Sutton. Um, Willie Sutton was a bank robber. He kept getting arrested for robbing banks. It was bad for Willie. And they asked him, Wiley, why do you do this? He said, because that's where the money is. That's why you're in there. <laughs> so where's the money? Anybody want to guess? 
today? Suggestions? I don't have it up there. So uh, there's uh, something called the SWIFT network. If you've ever got a money transfer, you may be familiar. It's the interbank system for transferring money. It's $3 trillion a day. And it's never been had. Well, what is that? That's like a pretty weird thing, isn't it? You know, all these uh, networks being hacked, right? Well, um, I should say, never been hacked that we know about. <laughs> so good. What it has is it has something called a trust network. And what that means is that there's a contract that's peer-to-peer -peer between all the banks. Remember, banks are in something like 163 different countries, many of which are nothing more than you know, criminal cabals. Um, and yet, they're able to transfer money safely, even in those sorts of places. So there's a contract. It's not like regulation. It's a contract between the banks that says, here's what you say on your computer network in order to make an offer of transferring the money. And here's the replies that you can make to receive the money. And here's the liability if you screw up. And incidentally, it's a joint liability. So I'm a bank. You two guys are talking. I'm going to pay attention because if you guys screw up, I might have to pay. Right? So everybody's watching everybody. Okay? The joint liability is part of it. So that's what the SWIFT network does. Visa. Everybody has a Visa card, right? They have a trust network, too. Oh, actually, it's not a trust network to you. It's between the banks and the Visa network, right? So, so they're safe. <laughs> oh, well. But so, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> but what you can do nowadays is you can take the same technology that these big guys developed, which took up lots of lawyers and computer programs, and you can make it consumer grade. If now we know how to do it. Computers are fast. You can just make it go. And so that's what we've done, is we've made a network like the SWIFT network that's for you. And it's open source, and we're just trying to get people to use it. And there's all sorts of people that are beginning to use it or thinking about it. State of Kansas, Mass General Hospital, Luxembourg, <laughs> Andorra. All sorts of we took a, a, a military project for secure identity. Remember those passwords called OpenID Connect? And we've taken over, made it open source, supported by an MIT industrial consortium, put in auditability and computer storage. And so this is a way where companies can adopt technology and legal framework to satisfy those regulations that are being proposed. And this is why people are interested in it as opposed to some radical thing, is that they may have to do this pretty soon, particularly starting in the EU. One of the cute innovations in the Open PDS is the following. So, how many people have heard about problems in re identifying data? Right. So, there's all these things about anonymous data, right? If you see somebody talk about anonymous data, you know that they don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> okay? Because there's, there's really essentially no such thing. If you take all the names out of some data, then I can almost always find another data source that lets you re identify those names. Okay? That's what the people found again and again. Now, that's different. There are ways of getting around that. Like in Diary Coast, if you aggregate it, so you put it in big piles, then you really, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to re identify. But, but this idea of sharing data is fraught with danger because while that data may be pretty harmless, if you combine it with other things, it may not be harmless. And I'll give you a, a key example is location data. So, uh, I'll give you another example. <laughs> yeah, I anyway, so, so a key example is location data. So I may want to offer you, of a company, I want to offer you some coupon, and I ask you, are you in San Francisco? And you return a latitude and longitude. Okay? Well, now let's say I do that fairly often. After a while, I'm going to know where you live, where you work, and where you hang out. And I'm going to know what sort of person you are and blah, blah, blah. Right? This is not a, uh, you know, a made-up example. This is how it works. And the thing is, is you shared much too much data when you gave them a precise location. What you should have said is, yes, I'm in San Francisco, or no, I'm not in San Francisco. And so what OpenPDS does is it answers questions, but it doesn't share data except when it has to. Okay? 
Okay? And that reduces the dimensionality of data and makes this whole privacy thing lots easier to deal with. It doesn't cure it, but it gets a lot better. So that's of interest, um, you know, if you're in the sort of computer stuff. The real answer for all of this stuff, though, is that it's not a policy thing. It's not a computer science-y thing. It's a deal with society. It's a new deal, OK? And the only way you're going to test it is not in a laboratory. It's not in the legislature. You've got to build it, stick it out in the real world, let real people live it. And uh, for various reasons, it turns out it's hard to do that in a country like the US, or in fact, in any large country. But it's easy to do it in small countries, <laughs> OK? Because they are just not as polarized, and the politics are simpler. And so uh, Trento in Italy, which you may think of as being in Italy, actually isn't. It's an independent province. So we convinced them to be able to put together a living lab where they could try open PDS, new ways of sharing data, and starting very small with young families that had just had children, because we thought they wanted to share data a lot, and some of it would be very personal data. Uh, and they also are economically stressed, so sharing spending data is an example. And what we're doing is we're letting them live the future with these new sorts of regulations in place to be able to see how it works. Right? Because the truth is, is you know, either people understand it and use it correctly, or it's useless. And in fact, you know, as bright as we are and we think we know everything, we don't. And we make mistakes, and sometimes they're pretty bad mistakes. And so you have to actually put things out in the real world and, and test them, They're called living labs. And that's what we as a country here need to do. We need to declare Rochester to be a living lab, right? You, you could try this stuff out and try and be able to put facts on the ground about the, the benefits and the dangers of big data and about how um, sharing policies, privacy policies should work. Now that sounds sort of crazy, but we're doing that not only here, but um, the Denmark Technical University in, our, in my group are giving smartphones to every student in their student body and personal data stores and being able trying to you know, live in the future. At MIT, we have in front of the president right now uh, a proposal from some of the leading computer science faculty to take our system and make it something that everybody at MIT uses. And the MIT community is almost 60,000 people. It's only 4,000 undergrads, but a lot of, a lot of hangers on. Right? <laughs> and, and that's what you need to do. You need to actually spin up things where you can try it out. It says this is sort of a computer science college. Um, you might want to think about that. Could you enroll everybody? Maybe opt in, of course, but enroll everybody on the campus in a big data experiment. Could you live in the future and see how it works? I think it'd be very relevant, not only to make it you know, personally relevant, but to create experience and facts that'll guide regulators, guide companies, alert us to dangers, show us opportunities, and sort of you know, start the movement. <laughs> Good. So that's that's it. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. We have time for a few questions. Please stand up. Um, the short answer is not much, uh, because it isn't specified precisely at this point, right? Um, the, the key thing is, is that uh, there are legal definitions of what informed consent means, and then there's sort of level of informed, okay? And the, another key item is the ability to revoke consent. So those are the things that you need to know. The standard that's out there 
um, that I think is informing people comes from medicine and from human subjects research, where there's uh, international coordination among what it means to inform human subjects for an experiment, or what it means to enroll people in a medical, un, uh, in a new medical uh, procedure. So, so there's already sort of an international sense of this, and it's a question of sharpening it up so that you know exactly what it means in the context of computers and stuff like that. I think that's the, the right thing to say. The other thing that's interesting um, is that remember, you know, at Davos there's sort of big, uh, not exactly a fight, but you, know, you get the idea, between the EU representative and the US representative uh, about uh, a couple of issues about, you know, how flexible can you be about this? But one thing they were in absolute agreement was is if you're a minor, if you're less than, than the age of majority, it's going to be really strict. It's going to be just like the uh, informed consent for human subjects, which for minors is very strict. There was a question. Uh, what do you do in your open uh, data store on, uh, to reduce the transaction cost of managing your own data? Just as a quick example, you mentioned your son in the video game and you know, uh, asking uh, to, to track you know, where you are and so forth. So uh, you get the, you know, conceivably you get these multiple times a day and okay, so should I give permission or not? And uh, I don't even want to think about, so okay, fine, I want to use yeah. the, the app. Uh, how can you reduce the transaction cost? So there's, there's a couple of things. Um, for instance, in Trento, um, there's a, uh, an app called Check App, right, which gives you sort of ratings of all the apps that you use in terms of the danger and invasiveness. And that then has a little interface that lets you manage that. But the truth is, 99% of the people won't use that, okay? Um, and so what we have, or what we imagine also in the future, because it's mostly imagining in the future, is that people like AARP, like the university, et cetera. People who have some sense of uh, being helpful or having custody will develop their own sort of procedures or standards. So what I'll get is something that says, would you like to follow MIT's suggested settings? Sure, right? Would you like to follow the AARP suggested settings? Yeah, okay. Or the Baptist Church's suggested, you know, whatever. Right? Because you're right, it's way too complicated. Nobody can really manage it. It's actually technically complicated enough that nobody in this room can really tell what's going to happen. I mean, when you get into differential privacy and some of the, the long-range effects, it's just hard to know. But there is, but that's not unusual. I mean, think about the financial stuff. You have financial advisors, you have retirement advisors. They're sort of best practice, but it's not perfect. And that's what we have to do, is think about this as an analogy with financial things. We have to try and do at least that. Maybe we can do a little better. It's just time for one more question. Are you, are you personally optimistic or uh, worried? Uh, uh, optimistic, but then I'm a pragmatist, right? So what I see is I see advantages for government, for hospitals, for telcos, to actually do this, to, to, to protect people's rights, um, so that they can be more free in other areas, okay? And so they can be more productive in other areas. And so it's in the interest of some of these big operators to actually give you more opt-in and more control so that they can have a free playing ground with, say, the aggregate data that they don't get much traction with today. So for big telcos, and you should remember I advise Telefonica, which is one of the biggest, you know, they want to be a white hat. They want to give you the view of your data. They absolutely want to do that. But they also want to take aggregates of that data and build businesses about it, things that can't be traced back to the individual. Or you take Mass General Hospital. If you can spin up things like this, personal data source, this is what we're doing, it turns out that you can really revolutionize medical research. Today, when you do a medical experiment, you, you know, map out the experiment, you do IRB, you recruit people. Now, sort of two years have gone by, typically. I'm serious, right? If everybody has personal data that they're collecting in their own stores, 
then you say, well, look, here's the experiment I want to do. You say that to the IRB board. And then you flick the switch. The data is already there. All you're doing is a con transfer of control of the data from the person to the experimenter under informed consent. It like, makes the, 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 the research cycle half to quarter the time that it would have otherwise been. Um, so those are just two of the examples, right? And I can come up with other, but, but it's, that's why I'm optimistic. Now, where is it not going to work? Well, still, people are going to cheat. Um, we have this whole unregulated part of the internet, the Facebook of, of the world, right? And it's going to be a long battle to put that back, the genie back in the bottle. Okay. But once the big guys are done, right? Once the big guys show that you can have a more respectful way to build a big data economy, something that preserves our ability to interact with it, the Facebooks of the world have come under real pressure. Because the question will be, well, you know, if Bank of America, for God's sake, can do it, why can't you do it? There's no real good answer to that one. So they're going to have to change the way they do business. But that's a long battle. Thank you. I'm afraid we don't have much time. So on, on behalf of the Thomas Golisono College, in appreciation for um, Sandy Pentland's inspiring talk, I'm giving this small. Uh, Thank you. It used to be you could live your life in uh, relative obscurity from uh, the point of view of the digital webs uh, that surround us. But today, as you move around, you leave breadcrumbs everywhere. And that's the thing that's really changed from your cell phone, from your credit cards, from driving down the highway. And that's huge data. It's continuous data. And that's really the difference. So I want to talk about that today and the, the good things about it and also the bad things about it. But first of all, I want to introduce myself a little bit, uh, maybe put a little humor into things. So this is me uh, back in 1993, uh, this one here. Because um, what occurred to me was people were beginning to talk about computers everywhere. I mean, I have to remember that PCs and things like that were you know, barely a decade old, and they were actually getting out into society, and the internet was beginning to grow. And, People talked about pervasive computing, computing everywhere. And I said, well, you know, actually, if computers are going to get that small and that powerful, they're going to get built into our cufflinks and our glasses and things like that long before they get built into walls, because we don't renovate the walls very much. So what I did is I created uh, uh, the first cyborg collective, right? So you got Star Trek, right, and the Borgs. We had the Borgs. We had it about the same time as they did, maybe a little before. These are some of the Borgs. And back then, to simulate what it would be like to live today, we had to have this on the advisory board of Motorola Mobility, which you might remember is owned by Google now, and uh, one of the biggest sort of client, mobile client of Google is Samsung. So they don't want to fight with Samsung. And what that means is that Motorola Mobility has to reinvent what it means to be a, a cell phone. And you remember I did the wearable computing stuff years ago? So, coming soon to a store near you. I also uh, am helping to run the first uh, uh, autonomous, commercially acceptable uh, autonomous vehicle in the world produced by Nissan. And uh, I advise Telefonica on what they ought to do. Start companies, do stuff like that. Forbes likes me. Anyway, so that's what I do. So let's talk about big data. Uh, I wanted to tell you that to give you a sense of where I come from, because this is my view on big data. It's not the canonical truth. There is no canonical truth at this point. So when you think about big data, what everybody thinks about is Google and Flickr and Facebook. And those are certainly important and familiar. Um, but that's actually not where the action is. I think that while those are things to be concerned about and think about, the real action is around the fact that wireless is finally here. So what this diagram shows is the distribution of wireless devices in the world. Okay, that's all the yellow stuff. The blue stuff are the big undersea cables that carry the bits around. But the thing that's the most striking change, students run around with these uh, motorcycle batteries, this big, right, you know, 10 pounds, 
and a PC-104 PC that was hot enough that you didn't want to touch it. Right? <laughs> and these little displays that are actually vibrating mirrors so that you could see stuff. But of course, today that turned into uh, Google Glass and all the watches that people are beginning to do. But the nice thing is, is that guy in front there, that's Thad Starner. So, so he's got into this enough that he wore that sort of thing for the next 20 years until Sergey Brin said, OK, guy, make it real. And now he's the technical lead for Google Glass. So I like to sometimes describe myself as the grandfather of Google Glass. <laughs> I didn't wear it for all those years, but, but we helped uh, cause the problem, shall we say. Um, I do a number of other things, too. As, as was mentioned, I run uh, Coley the, the discussion around big data and personal data, which is privacy uh, and security at the World Economic Forum. So there's a, if you ever wondered what it's like, you know, to go to Davos and the World Economic that's what it looks like. It doesn't look like too much. It's a hotel room with a bunch of people and business suits and stuff. But they're pretty amazing people. I mean, the vice president of the EU is in there. There's a special representative from the National Security Council. There's the CEO of uh, Visa. The, you know, it's, it's a sort of interesting crowd. And, and my role is to make sure that they talk and not fight. Right? OK. And then I do a number of other things, too. So I'm Thank you for coming to the uh, lecture. Uh, and welcome to the B. Thomas Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences, as well as the Dean's Lecture Series. And this is the first of the lectures for this year. And I am Mohan Kumar, the uh, chair of the Department of Computer Science in the Golisano College. And it is my pleasure and privilege today to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Sandy Pentland of MIT. The goal of this lecture series, which was started about 10 years ago, is to bring uh, leading minds from academia, from industry, and from the government to RIT campus and uh, share their ideas with the students and faculty in, at RIT. And today's speaker is the 48th, 48th speaker in this series. Wow. So we have two more to go to celebrate. <laughs> so at this time, I would also like to acknowledge our professional interpreter, Kate, for translating the uh, talk to the uh, audience. And again, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Sandy Pentland. Sandy is a globally recognized authority on big data. And he's the director of the MIT's Human Dynamics Program and the MIT Media Lab Entrepreneur Program. In addition, Sandy is the lead academic for the World Economic Forum's Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives. And he was chosen by Forbes as one of the world's seven most powerful data scientists. So in today's lecture, titled Social Physics and the Beginning of Big Data Society, Sandy will discuss the impact of big data and the need for a new deal on data to preserve privacy and personal safety. So sit tight. I've heard Sandy talk before, and it will be a great talk. I can assure you that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good turnout here. This is great. And a beautiful day. Um, so thank you. So what I wanted to do today is talk about sort of my view about big data and um, the things that I think are the most important and the things that are misunderstood. So big data is this you know, buzz phrase. It's everywhere. Everything's big data. Um, and you see these definitions like, you know, it's volume, velocity. It's like, well, yes and no. I mean, actually. Uh, if you look at video, video is bigger, you know, online video, bigger, faster than almost anything else. Uh, and it's been around for decades in very many formats. So what I think is actually different is not so much the bigness of it as the depth of it. Um, so now we have data that is very detailed data about all sorts of things, but most importantly about people. Um, 